Good afternoon and welcome to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Joshua Finch of NASA's Communication. We're here to discuss NASA's SpaceX Demo 2 mission. Teams from NASA and SpaceX just completed the flight readiness review and we're joined by participants who can tell us more about that review. We'll first start with our presenters. First, we have NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. NASA Associate Administrator Stephen Jersick. Kathy Leaders, Manager of NASA's Commercial Crew Program. Kirk Shireman, Manager, International Space Station Program. Benji Reed, Director of Crew Mission Management at SpaceX. And Norm Knight, Deputy Director at NASA's Johnson Space Center Flight Operations. We're going to begin with opening comments from our presenters, and then we'll turn it over to questions. We're going to start with NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, who does have to leave a little bit early during today's briefings. So we'll start with Mr. Bridenstine. Well, thank you, Josh. And it is good to be here at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we are obviously in the media room where we have had many conferences before. Um, you know, I remember fondly Demo 1. I remember fondly the launch abort test. And this room was absolutely packed. Um, and here we are today uh, in an empty room talking to cameras um, and all of us are six feet apart. And of course we all walked in here with our masks on and, um, and of course what we are doing here today exemplifies um, what we were doing in the, in the launch readiness review. Um, so these are different times but it is also a time when we need to be doing amazing things as a nation and inspiring the entire world and that's what we're doing. Uh, the flight readiness review is complete. We have another milestone under our belts. Um, it was a good review, great discussion. Um, I think everybody in the room was very clear that now is the time to speak up if there are any challenges. Um, and, and there were. Uh, there were conversations that were had that were very important to be had. But it's also true that at the end, um, as, as, as each system and subsystem was considered, um, at the end, we got to a go. So, um, so we, are, we are now preparing for a launch in, in five short days. So um, I want to say it's good to be here at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, there's uh, a lot of work left to do. Uh, the launch is on, or the rocket is on the pad, and uh, we've got a static fire in front of us, or I should say a hot fire in front of us, as well as um, a lot of checks to do. But, um, but the, uh, the launch readiness review was good, and, um, and we are a go. So with that, Josh, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. And now we'll go to Stephen Jersick. Thank you, Josh. Um, so first I want to say it was a, um, an honor to chair the first uh, flight readiness review for a uh, crew transportation system developed in the U.S. Um, in nine years. Um, so it, was, it definitely was an honor, and I was humbled um, to be the chair of the flight readiness review um, for the SpaceX Commercial Crew Demo 2 flight. Um, like Jim said, it was an excellent review. Um, I knew going in that the team was ready, we were, and we were ready to do this review, and they absolutely demonstrated that, that during the review. Um, day and a half of really good uh, presentations, really good discussions, and we accomplished what we needed to accomplish to determine that we are ready for flight. Um, there are no significant open issues, I am happy to report. Um, it was a very, in the end, it was a very, very clean review. Um, there's just the planned forward work um, to get done. There's all, quite a bit of it between now and launch. 
Um, but we are ready to launch on Wednesday, May 27th at 4.33 p.m. And uh, it is, um, it's, it's the, uh, a credit to the team, the SpaceX NASA team, uh, for their hard work and dedication um, to get to this point. Um, one thing I mentioned in the Flight Readiness Review was this team represents the values of NASA. Um, safety, um, they have been laser focused on um, safely launching Bob and Doug into space, getting them to the space station and returning them home safely. I've, teamwork, I've never seen a team work together this effectively uh, to, to uh, conquer the challenges um, to get to this point. Uh, integrity in everything they've done. Uh, I've just been so impressed with the openness and frankness of all our discussions, um, which is really critical um, to get to um, the point where we're ready to launch. And then excellence. Um, if you were in the flight radius interview and heard the briefings um, from the engineering team, uh, just incredible uh, engineers, and uh, they demonstrated the, a, uh, the excellence that we expect uh, from both uh, SpaceX as well as uh, NASA. Um, and I could not be more proud of the team. So thank you very much, Josh. And we'll now go to Kathy Leaders. Kathy? Wow. Oh, a really big day for the joint uh, NASA SpaceX commercial crew team. Uh, I am so grateful for the NASA and SpaceX team who have dug deep <laughs> and worked so hard to get us to this point. Um, just, we have a tremendous team and I'm very, very proud of them. I'm proud of the opportunity we had to be able to present to the agency um, our readiness and then have them agree. So very, very proud of the team, very proud of the team and the culmination of their work. Um, I, I'm just, I'm in awe that I get to lead this team. It's really an honor. But we're not done. You know, we talked a few weeks ago about we got to do this right. And we got to launch Bob and Doug. We got to make sure they're taken care of on orbit. And we got to make sure they get home. And uh, we are committed to do that. And we're going to stay vigilant over the next few days. We still have a static fire. Uh, Jim, you did get that right. It is a static fire. <laughs> um, and we, tomorrow we have also another really important event. It's a dry dress. It's, it's kind of our last uh, run through with the crew to make sure that we're really ready to get ready for launch. And then we have our final launch readiness review on Monday. So um, I'm really proud of this team. We're going to take it one step at a time. And we're going to still fly when we're ready. But thank you to my whole team, to the NASA team, to the SpaceX team, to the ISS team that has helped us get this far. And we'll now go to Kirk Shireman. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm uh, very excited to uh, have been able to participate in this review. So much like we have the preparations Kathy was describing here uh, on, uh, on the planet, I can tell you there's uh, great things and preparations going on on orbit. So last Wednesday, JAXA launched the HTV, and so as we're conducting our review here, uh, the HTV is rapidly catching up to the International Space Station and will be uh, arriving to the ISS on Monday. So just a few days before Demo-2 launches, it'll arrive to ISS. It'll be grappled by Chris Casty, and by the time Demo-2 arrives, it'll be, uh, it'll be part of the space station. Um, I had a chance to talk to uh, the on orbit crew, so Chris, uh, Yvonne, and Anatoly Wednesday, just shortly, just, just a few minutes really before I left to come down here to the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, I can tell you those guys are uh, very focused, very uh, uh, excited, and, uh, and are preparing for having Bob and Doug arrive uh, on orbit. So uh, great preparations going on on orbit. Um, and finally, um, coming home, we'll bring home Bob and Doug safely, but we're also counting on bringing home some, uh, some experimental results on, uh, on the Dragon, too. So a great test flight, but also uh, the ability to, uh, to make use of, the, of, uh, of that vehicle to bring home some, uh, some experiments uh, that have been on orbit for a while. So looking forward to that opportunity. So this year, we're celebrating 20 years of having humans living and working in space. And, uh, and we're very, very much excited to have um, the first humans launch the International Space Station since July 8, 2011. So July 8, 2011, last time um, humans left the planet here in Kennedy and the Kennedy Space Center and went to the International Space Station. 
very much looking forward to next week. Um, having Bob and Doug on orbit, continuing human uh, presence in National Space Station, learning and exploring. Uh, so with that, it's my great pleasure to, uh, to introduce to you uh, Benji Reed, director at uh, SpaceX and a, and a good friend. He and his team have worked tremendously over the last few uh, years to make us here today. So, Benji. Thank you very much, Kirk. You know, it is, um, use the word there, friends, and I think it's important. You know, we're not just colleagues here um, uh, or even just partners. Um, over the years, we've built friendships. Um, but in those friendships, we hold each other accountable. Um, it's an honor. Um, the responsibility that we carry um, jointly with NASA and our friends and partners um, and our company at SpaceX um, and it's a sacred honor and and those are meaningful words when we say that um, our job is to carry Bob and Doug to the space station hand them to Kirk um, let them uh, do what they get to do on space station help keep the space station running and safe and then we need to bring them home safely back to their families as we like to often uh, mention, you know, they are dads. Um, they've got families back home, um, and it's just, um, just as important as we're all taking care of each other through these interesting times, we're needing to take care of the crew and bring them home. Um, and again, on that sacred journey together, we all are holding each other accountable. And as Kathy said, there's more to do. Today we got to go, and it was a, a monumental and uh, incredible journey to get to today's review. But um, we still have our static fire this afternoon, our dry dress, as Kathy mentioned, tomorrow. And then we have our own launch readiness review, uh, which NASA will be attending and with us um, just before launch to ensure that we're really ready. Um, but just to talk a little bit about what got us into, you know, recently to today, uh, we've got a few photos I thought it ni might be nice to bring up. Uh, there's Dragon um, getting ready to uh, uh, be transported. Um, from uh, where we prepare the vehicles over to the hangar. Um, we can go to the next shot. And there's Dragon um, and Falcon mated together, uh, ready to roll out to the pad. We'll go to the next shot. And there they are. They're in the transport erector. The, uh, the barn door is open. The, uh, the door to the hangar is open. And Dragon is ready to leave, um, heading up to the pad. And there they are, um, erected on the pad. Um, the crew arm there is, has moved into position. It's uh, attached to or against the Dragon now, and, and uh, we're ready. We're ready to go into static fire now in just uh, a little bit, about an hour and a half from now. Um, we talk a lot about uh, the whole mission. Today we got to go to launch, but really it's a go to the mission. There'll be lots more data, lots more reviews in the next few days. There'll be constant vigilance and watching of the data and observations as we go through the mission. Um, there'll be other reviews and conversations to make sure we're go for each aspect, including go to come home. But really, we always need to think about this as an entire mission and again, bringing Bob and Doug home safely. Um, and to that end, I think we've got a new video that we've pulled together to show our parachutes um, and uh, a new compilation of all the parachute work that we've done. shot there is a beautiful image of uh, the capsule coming home from our demo one test um, and uh, you know it, it is so incredible being here uh, here at Kennedy Space Center um, the you know the home of launching astronauts from space of American astronauts from American soil on American vehicles and and we get to do it again in just a f uh, five days and so on behalf of all the teams working Dragon and Falcon and and uh, you know our hardware and software teams and everybody in our factory all the way to our operations groups, we are honored to be um, that you, the NASA has trusted us with this endeavor, that Bob and Doug trust us, um, and uh, we're excited to do it. Thank you very much. And now we'll go to Norm Knight.
All right. Uh, well, it's a real honor to be here with you this afternoon. It was uh, it was a fun two days, very long days. Um, but from a crew perspective, this review was fantastic. Uh, we're satisfied with the discussions that were had, the thoroughness and the readiness of folks coming in and having the necessary discussions to assure that uh, Doug and Bob are safe. And again, it's crew safety, vehicle safety, and test flight objectives in that order uh, as far as the discussion goes with, uh, with respect to, to risk and how that risk is managed. So we're very satisfied with that and we're thankful for the teams, not only at SpaceX, but across the agency with engineers and safety engineers and integration folks that have really pulled together to make this a success. So um, again, it was, uh, it was a really good day. But you know, it didn't just start with this review. Uh, it was really a journey that, uh, again, friendship and partnership with SpaceX that started many years ago. And the astronaut office has been actively involved uh, with SpaceX. It was a joint test team that was formed to, to embed the astronauts and our team members in with SpaceX to work together, to, to work in the development, to work into the human factors, and to make sure that the training was done and conducted in a joint manner so that we can, uh, again, meet those objectives of crew safety and vehicle safety. Uh, that was done very well. That was a great journey. A lot of folks were involved with that, and, um, and it was very successful. The trust that was built with these teams over many years uh, will pay infinite dividends because that trust, I call it the fabric of trust, is what holds us together as teams when things get stressed and strained and we're working uh, issues and anomalies and, and getting ready for flight test readiness reviews and things like that. That's what's going to hold us together for this and that's what's going to hold us together throughout this whole mission uh, from the time the crew leaves uh, astronaut crew quarters to the time that they are returned and safely uh, touched down and returned back to their families. Uh, that is all of our objectives whether you're from SpaceX or NASA is get the crew back safely. Today was also uh, another great milestone, uh, really, in the continued uh, journey and, and road that NASA is paving for human exploration. And it's great. Uh, it, it dovetails right in with Artemis, and it's part of this overall objective of NASA paving a road that our commercial partners are going to travel upon as we go forward. So very exciting. Give you a quick preview of uh, the crew schedule as we go forward. Tomorrow's a big day, as Kathy said. It's the uh, dry dress. Uh, the crew will get up in the morning around 8 a.m. and start doing dry dress preparations. They'll get some briefings. They'll suit up. They'll head to the pad, and it'll be a dry dress and a practice run uh, and prep for launch. So we're very excited with that. The culmination of that will be uh, a debrief. They'll head back to the uh, astronaut crew quarters where they've been in quarantine and uh, start getting uh, prepared for additional training and launch preps. So with that, again, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Norm. And I believe that's about the time that we have today with Administrator Jim Brinstein. Thank you for being with us for opening comments. And we're now going to transition over to taking your questions. You can take questions using the hashtag AskNASA. And then, of course, we have media dialed in on the phone bridge. So we'll start with our first question from Michael Sheets. Michael? Hi, folks. Uh, thanks again, as always, for uh, hosting this. Uh, I'm really curious, um, in, in the length and thoroughness of this uh, review that we did the last two days. Uh, aside from the technical takeaways, what what should people understand about what the this panel together concluded in preparation for Demo 2? Is this a, a spacecraft that NASA has deemed uh, human rated? Is, is that the, the broad takeaway? And, uh, you know, how, how do people who aren't in maybe a savvy uh, with the industry should understand this means uh, in preparation for the launch. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, first and foremost, this was a readiness review for the Demo 2 launch. Um, so we went over, like Mr. Brinesign discussed, all the, all the systems on the spacecraft, on the launch vehicle, on the ground, um, and ensured that all the issues um, had been closed satisfactorily, and they were. In fact, they were, all those issues were closed out prior to the review. Um, all the waivers, all the deviations, all the requirements verifications, all of that was done prior to the review and closed out um, by the program, both, uh, both NASA and SpaceX. Um, so it was a very 
successful FR for Demo 2. It also was an interim, interim human rating certification review. And uh, what I mean by interim is that um, we validated that this system meets the human, cer human rating certification requirements um, for the Demo 2 mission. Um, and those requirements feed forward to future missions, uh, including the Crew-1 mission. Um, we will have a final human rating certification review um, after Demo-2 and before the Crew-1 mission, uh, just to certify the relatively um, small set of design changes between uh, the Demo-2 system and the Crew-1 system. And at that point, we'll deem the uh, system uh, human rating certified. Uh, but today's review and the interim human rating certification uh, went a long way to uh, certifying the uh, system for, uh, for crewed flight. And our next question is from Marina Corin from The Atlantic. Marina. Hi, everyone. Kirk, uh, this is a question for you. Last year before the uncrewed demonstration flight, there was some disagreement between you and your Russian counterparts about the capsule's approach to the ISS which of course was resolved before launch. Um, did any officials from Roscosmos provide any dissenting opinions this time around on anything? Well, Roscosmos actually was part of our review for the last two days. So Roscosmos, a number of, uh, of our Russian colleagues participated, uh, and they participated from Moscow. So while they were long days for us, they were actually long nights for our Russian colleagues. Uh, by the way, the, our Japanese colleagues participated from Japan, so uh, quite, quite the, uh, the, the um, uh, marathon for many of us. But uh, Russia, our Russian colleagues work with us in the interim between uh, Demo 1 and, uh, and Demo 2. I, we've had countless discussions with them about all the requirements, about uh, all the waivers that we've taken. And, uh, and so we went through all those, technically explained to our Russian colleagues, answered their questions. Uh, and finally, a, a, a big shout out to SpaceX. One of the big concerns that, that uh, Roscosmos had was a, a, um, a very, very remote possibility of a failure. But if that failure occurred, it could cause uh, damage, perhaps even catastrophic damage to the ISS. SpaceX said, we understand and we'll make a modification. So SpaceX actually went out and made a modification to their vehicle between Demo 1 and Demo 2. So it was really some of all those things. Great communication with our Russian partners, uh, an outstanding effort on behalf of SpaceX to, to close that gap. Um, and, and then the, uh, the trust that we've built over the, uh, over the years to get us today. So Roscosmos participated and they were go and no concerns with that remaining issue. And our next question is from Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Stephen? Hi, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I had a question, I guess, for CASI leaders maybe. Um, I, I know the commercial crew program requirement for the loss of crew risk is 1 in 270. Uh, I know there's uh, reason not to look too hard at these numbers, but that, as I understand, was a requirement for the commercial crew program. Just curious uh, uh, where you ended up in the loss of crew number for this mission and what mitigations uh, operationally uh, or physically on the spacecraft uh, you had to do in recent months or recent uh, last year or two to get to that uh, 1 in 270 requirement. Thanks. So we actually, um, between the SpaceX and operational controls, we actually were meeting our 1 in 270 requirement um, for and it's, and it's not just a mission, it's really, it's an overall certification requirement. So, um, and so uh, with, with all the work that we've been doing with SpaceX on the modeling, on the different aspects of their design, and um, obviously MMOD mitigation and inspection, um, uh, that requirement was closed out um, acceptably. And our next question is from Tim Fernholtz at Quartz. Tim? Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for doing this, and good luck. Uh, two questions, if I might. One for Steve. I'm just curious for those of us who haven't participated in a flight readiness review. Can you give us, like, a tangible example of, uh, you know, the kind of back and forth that might happen in that room? And, you know, does it get down to the engineers on a specific subcomponent area, or is it at a, a more high level? Uh, and for Benji, I'm just curious, I know it's hard to put an exact number on this, but can you talk about how SpaceX has invested in developing the Crew Dragon alongside taxpayers? Thank you all. 
So, um, you know, a big part of a flight readiness review is reviewing and accepting risk, the risks. Um, whenever we fly, um, there are going to be residual risks. Um, the Kathy and Benji and their team did a great job along the way uh, in these many years of identifying risks, um, understanding them, uh, mitigating them through design changes and operational controls um, to the point where we were able to accept a lot of them, most of them, along the way. Um, so an example of, uh, of one uh, that we've been uh, that the team has been working on over the last six months or so were the dra Dragon parachutes. Um, so we established um, a little while ago that the original chute designs did not have adequate margin based on some knowledge we had gained through testing about how the chutes deploy and the loading on the chutes. So SpaceX stepped up and did a new uh, chute design and we had to qualify that new chute design um, to hire margins than we had pre the previous shoots. Um, the NASA SpaceX team did an amazing job laying out a test program and executing that test program. Um, however, um, it's fewer tests than we normally would see on a parachute qualification program. Um, so we took uh, a long time and a couple of presentations during the review to have the team walk us through the design, um, the changes, the qualification testing and and the margins on the shoot to make sure that everybody was good with how they, those shoots were qualified and we had very high confidence that they will um, function as we need them to uh, when Bob and Doug return uh, from the International Space Station. And our next question is from Eric Berger, Ars Technica. Eric. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for doing this. I guess the question maybe for Kathy, you know, it's been a little more than a year ago when there was the accident, when they were testing the um, the Super Drago thrusters, and, and it was a pretty pretty visceral image, visceral image of, of what happened on the pad there, and at the test pad. And I'm just wondering, did you think we would get here a year later to, to where we're ready to launch crew now after that accident? Well, I've been doing this for a really long time. I told somebody I'm like the, I feel like an old lady now after kind of working vehicle development now for 14 years. And, and don't ever underestimate the value of a failure, right? I've learned that um, when I look at over my career, when we've made the, the biggest um, progress, it's been in learning from a failure and then using that as a step function to move you to the next level. So, but you also um, should never um, underestimate how much work it is for you to overcome it, right? So, um, we always had a plan. We had a plan, actually, we had a plan that we were trying to fly, you know, potentially by the end of December, but we weren't going to fly until we're ready until we work through all the testing and everything we needed. So um, I, I look back on last April and the static fire was really for us to get ready for our in-flight abort test that was supposed to happen in June. And I think that was a real blessing for us. We learned a ton about our system and uh, have made a spacecraft and expanded the knowledge of uh, materials in uh, NTO systems to an extent that give us a real sustained, um, you know, uh, understanding of our systems and further robustness of the new design that we have. So um, uh, last April, I probably wasn't thinking I was going to be flying in a year, but you know what? You can never, you can never sell this NASA and SpaceX team short and they've always accomplished miracles for me, and I'm very, very proud of them right now. Thank you, Kathy. And I think I skipped over one question for Benji uh, about how SpaceX has contributed. Uh, Benji, do you want to answer that question from Tim Fernholtz? Great, sure, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so I can't you know, give you the exact dollar amount. There's you know, proprietary and competitive reasons why um, we can't, but I can tell you absolutely that SpaceX has invested heavily um, 
into this partnership and into the development of you know Dragon and Falcon. If you go all the way back to the days when you know we were developing our Falcon One vehicle, you know that's the, the the fundamental systems and processes, and even a lot of the the development of the engineers and team that that created Falcon One are still working on the program today. Um, and then you can you fast forward and you look at the development of Falcon 9 and Dragon again in partnership um, with uh, with with NASA um, under the COTS program and the cargo programs and then continuing through now to the Crew Dragon. Um, uh, the partnership is is definitely a two-way street, and we've put a lot of um, time and energy and and finance into that effort um, to ensure that you know we're ready to fly as we will be in, in you know in five days. Um, a, a lot of what you should look at is you see the, the workforce that we've developed, you see the technologies that we've developed um, to ensure that, um, that, that we're ready to fly. Um, another element to, I think it's important to pay attention to is, is you know, kind of the, the, I won't say pioneering because we weren't the first to do firm fixed price contracting, but I think it's, it's you know, we, we've been uh, champions is a good word of firm fixed price contracting um, from the beginning. You know, fundamentally, this is about saying to the taxpayer, hey, you, there's something you want us to do. Um, here's how much we're going to charge for it, and we're going to go do it for that amount of money. And that's a, that's a, in some ways, I think it used to be a pr pretty revolutionary concept, and I think we've shown that that is a very effective tool for um, getting the best value to the government, to NASA, and to the, to the American taxpayer. Um, and, uh, and as you know, it's recently reported, um, you know, estimated that, that this program overall will have saved um, NASA, you know, maybe 30 to 40 billion dollars at least, um, and that's a, that's a significant thing to think about and see how that how we continue, you know, again those firm fixed price contracts and the kind of partnership and truly open partnership where we work together allows that kind of savings to happen and that kind of um, ability for NASA to invest in more things um, and do other programs. Our next question is from Lauren Grush at The Verge. Lauren. Hi, thanks for doing this. I was wondering if you could go through all the possible abort scenarios for this flight. You know, at which points are the aborts available and how does that put constraints on when you can launch, notably whether, you know, how big of an area do you need to consider on launch day? Thanks. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll talk a little about that and then, Norm, if you wanted to add anything to it as well. But I think that the, um, you know, uh, number one, um, one of the key requirements of this program is to have, a, have an abort system. And, and we want to develop our, our vehicle to have this, you know, integrated abort system, uh, what we call the launch escape system. Um, those are the Super Dracos um, uh, on the vehicle, the Super Draco engines. And, um, and it's, a, it's a very effective system um, that we hope we never, ever, ever have to use. Um, it's sort of like the airbags in your car, or the ejection seat in a jet um, plane. You know, you, 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 have, you put a lot into it, you test it, and you make sure it's going to work, and then you hope you never, ever have to use it. Um, you know, in uh, 2015, we did our pad abort test um, to demonstrate that, that we could escape from the pad and into the water, um, bring them, uh, come down safely into the water with the astronauts. Um, and then again, in January of this year, we did the in-flight abort test, um, launched on a Falcon 9, and, uh, and, and initiated the launch escape system um, mid-flight um, in some of the, the, the roughest moments of the, of the launch and demonstrated again that that, that launch escape system can bring um, the vehicle down and bring the crew home safely um, to the water and then be, be able to be recovered. Um, uh, you asked the question about when is it available. It's really available almost the entire time. One of the goals of this, of this system is to not have any blackout periods where you really can't um, where, where that system doesn't doesn't function, um, you know, and, and that's that's a, a big step in the history, of the the evolution of using these systems. Um, and a good example of that, you know, a little while back, um, um, on one of the Soyuz launches, they 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 needed to use the the launch escape system, and it worked great. And that was, um, but the the uh, part of flight where they needed to use it was actually something that that they had been expanding into. So over time, they had continued to improve that system. Um, in the same way that, that, you know, we've been charged to do the same thing on our system to ensure that, uh, you know, you can cover all of the path of flight. Um, you asked about weather and what we need to might look for, and that's a really important point. And I didn't mention it earlier, but I think it's important to talk about weather. 
um, on uh, you know coming up here for launch day. Um, it looks really nice outside today, but uh, you know we're always monitoring a lot of things, and and it does have very much to do with the launch support system on Dragon 2. So when we're normally flying a Falcon mission, say with a satellite uh, fairing mission, um, we're monitoring a lot of different things. We're looking at ground winds, we're looking at lightning, we're looking at upper atmosphere winds um, along the ascent trajectory. Um, but you know it's 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 focused particularly on the Falcon, and we'll be looking at all of those um, and the same kind of thresholds um, to uh, to call off the launch um, for Falcon. We'll do that the same for the crew missions. But now we need to add into that all of the uh, the all of the weather along the entire ascent track of where we might need to uh, escape the crew, abort the crew off of Falcon. Um, and it's really um, there's 50 points. Um, where we're monitoring weather, over 50 points actually, where we're monitoring weather uh, all the way along the ascent track, which means from, from, the, from here in Florida all the way up the eastern seaboard of, the, of North America, United States and Canada, and all the way over basically to Ireland across the northern Atlantic. We'll be monitoring that weather, um, and along that way we're monitoring a lot of the same things. We're looking at winds, we're looking at lightning, we're looking at precipitation, and we're actually looking at waves. We're looking at wave velocity and wave height. Um, because we need to make sure that if the crew had to come down um, in a launch escape scenario that they would come down in a sea state that would keep them safe and that the rescue forces would be able to come and get them. Again, we hope we never have to use that, but we're monitoring all of those uh, parameters as we go along um, and we don't launch until we know that we're ready. And our next question is from Leo Enright at Irish TV. All right, and it looks like we lost that connection, so we'll go to Irene Klotz at Aviation Week. Irene? Thanks, Josh. Uh, my question's for Benji Reed. Given what you've learned uh, working with NASA on commercial crew for all these years, how much faster do you think SpaceX can get to crew flight with Starship? So that's a great question, um, although I have to say that our focus today, of course, is on Demo 2, um, and my focus particularly has been on the commercial crew program. Super excited as we develop um, Starship and, st and, and develop that in partnership with NASA in, um, in the contracts that we're already working, the programs are already working with them. Um, again, it'll, it'll, it's a process, um, and I would say, though, that you know, just looking at the development of the NASA SpaceX partnership from the cargo days, um, now through the crew days, you know, the having worked together and understood each other and influenced each other, um, you know, we've learned a lot from NASA and um, and we've taken a lot from them. And I think we've we've given back. And I think NASA has grown and changed in ways um, uh, that are valuable and productive for them as well. And I think that every time you do this together, it's going to get better. We'll get more efficient and and, and do better. And um, you know, we were just, I was just chatting with um, uh, the, uh, the director of Marshall's uh, Center and, um, you know, talking about, you know, some of the new programs that we'll be working on with them there too um, uh, for Starship. And we're excited. We're excited to continue that partnership and, and make it work better and more efficient and always safer and more reliable. And our next question is from Mike Wall, space.com. Mike. Thank you all. Um, yeah, this, this is a question about kind of what, like, what the next steps are going forward up, like, between now and, and actually launch day. I'm, I'm just mostly curious about, like, what, what do you need to kind of tick off on, like, during the review this, this like, coming Monday that, that you guys didn't talk about during, yeah, during the flight readiness review? So, so that's probably for, if I guess, Benji. Like, what, like what's Monday's review going to look like and how, and how it's going to be different from what's already been discussed? Launch readiness review is, is ultimately the, the final check to make sure that, that everything that, that was open, any open issues or concerns, that those have been answered. Anything um, new that, we've, that we may have discovered, again, has been, open, has been closed and answered. Um, but particularly, it's really a, an assessment of the data, right? We'll have done our, our static fire that we're doing here shortly this afternoon. Um, it will have done our wet dress, or I'm sorry, our dry dress rehearsal with the crew. Um, and that's a ton of data. Really, really important that all of our engineers, and they're all on deck and ready to go right now, and for the next few days through the weekend, they will be analyzing and look at all the data and all the observations that are made. Um, and launch readiness review is to, to go again across all of the teams and every person and say, are you ready? What did you learn? What came out of the data? Are we ready to go? 
And our next question is from Emory Kelly, Florida Today. Emory? <clears throat> hey, folks. Thanks for, thanks for doing this. I, I appreciate it. Um, Administrator Bridenstine mentioned, you know, over the course of the past two days, folks could could speak up if, if they had any questions. And, 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 and I know you mentioned the um, discussion between between the Russians uh, and the issue resolved between Demo 1 and Demo 2, and I know you discussed parachutes. I'm curious if there was anything else that, that came up uh, yesterday and today that, that maybe led to some longer discussions that, that sticks out. Thank you. Yeah, so the other two um, kind of technical special topics we had um, were, was the uh, NTO um, titanium compatibility issue um, that was discovered um, during the Dragon um, hot fire test back in April. Um, I, also a tremendous amount of um, work done by the NASA SpaceX team to understand that um, and to figure out how to mitigate and control that um, hazard. and. Um, a lot, of, a lot of questions to just understand um, where we were and make sure that we were ready to um, accept that risk, the residual risk there for the Demo-2 flight, which we are. Um, again, I cannot tell you the amount of testing that was done by the White Sands uh, test facility team and the SpaceX team in McGregor, particularly the SpaceX team in McGregor over the past few weeks this has done a tremendous amount of testing um, and that testing gives us confidence that um, we have a system that's going to perform um, and we'll have that abort capability that Benji was discussing earlier. Uh, another one was uh, a, a more late breaking um, issue, late breaking within the next month or so, not days, but late, um, on um, a performance shortfall of the fire suppression system. Um, so the team, it's a system that um, suppresses any fire underneath uh, if it had any equipment or, or anything on the floor uh, of Dragon, underneath the floor of Dragon. And um, so the team again analyzed both the hazards there as well as the ability of the system to suppress a fire. Um, and um, the, uh, we deemed the risk to be very low there. Uh, and so we were able to review that data and that great work done by the team and accept that risk. So a couple of examples of technical uh, issues that had been closed out before the review. Um, but were reviewed by the board, lots of questions, lots of back and forth, and in the end, we agreed with the program there, that with them closing those issues and we were ready to proceed. And our next question is from Jeff Faust at Space News. Jeff? <clears throat> yeah, good afternoon. Um, actually, just to sort of follow up on the previous question, there's, you know, discussion that there's still some open work left to do to, to tie up loose ends before the launch. Um, can you give some examples of some of that open work that still has to be done um, between now and presumably the launch readiness review on Monday? Thanks. So I think, you know, we, we mentioned the open work. There's um, final checkouts on the spacecraft that happened, like um, prior to final hatch closure. Um, that's normal, uh, standard work. Uh, we already mentioned the big event. The big event, obviously, is static fire today, making sure the launch vehicle, final checkouts on the vehicles are done. Um, going through and doing dry dress, I mean, like we already talked about, dry dress and making sure that whole system for delivery of the crew to the pad, working through all those pieces, making sure everything's working, you know, days before the launch. Um, that's all normal open work. Um, and then doing the job of going through all the data out of the tests, you know, we'll be working, you know, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, you know, Tuesday up to launch day to make sure that we're still checking everything out. You know, I, I talked a couple weeks ago about continuing to dot the I's and cross the T's and that's the kind of open work we're talking about right now. And our next question is from Dave Mosier at Business Insider. Dave? And our next question will actually be from Jackie Goddard with the Irish Times of London. Jackie? 
for Times, yes. Hello, thank you. My question, I think, is for Kirk. Earlier this week, there was a report from Sputnik, the Russian government news agency, that quoted Roscosmos officials um, saying that they were monitoring increased benzene levels inside the space station. They stressed there was no threat to crew and that the concentrations um, didn't exceed the exposure limit. But can you tell us what that's all about? Was there any focus of conversation at the review? And does it raise any potential for concern with sending two additional crew up? Thank you. Well, the, what's going on in the Russian government, uh, I'm, not, I'm not the right person to ask. I think Roscosmos would be the right, right group to ask. I can tell you that we work very closely with our Russian partners. I speak to them, um, if, not, uh, if not daily, certainly weekly. Um, we actually have some people uh, in my organization who live in Moscow, and uh, so we're very, very close, great partners. Um, there has been no discussion about any change, any immediate change uh, in, in the work that they're doing. Certainly no increased risk to the, uh, to the crew today uh, as a result of any of this. So I'm not concerned at all uh, about that. I think maybe what they're referring to might be longer term uh, um, decisions that the Russian government and the Russian Space Agency could make, but, but that would really be a question for them. Um, so uh, the Russian crew, I actually spoke with uh, Ivan and Anatoly on orbit le this week, and they're very excited about, uh, about having two more crew members come up there. The ISS is in great shape. Um, the crew on orbit's in great shape. I know the crew here on the ground, you guys just talked with them. They're in great shape. So I think, uh, I think the, the vehicle uh, on, on orbit's ready to go, and, uh, and we're working to make the vehicle here on the ground ready to go. Great. And our next question is from Antonia Amarillo with Florida Today. Yes, hi. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I was wondering, why does it take Crew Dragon um, 19 hours to reach the International Space Station when it only takes Soyuz six hours? And uh, can Crew Dragon, you know, get there to the space station quicker? Uh, and if so, why hasn't SpaceX and NASA decided to do that? Thanks. You bet. <laughs> um, absolutely. I mean, it, it really, it's, it's about orbital mechanics. It's about when you launch, right? There's, uh, there's phasing that you have to do to get to the space station. And so you look at the different launch opportunities, again, based on weather um, and a whole number of other factors. Um, and, and, you, and you determine when's the best time to launch. And so you set up a number of launch opportunities, days and times. Um, and some of those launch opportunities require more phasing time. Um, and some of them require less. And so the, on the 27th, it's about a 19 hour phasing, but then you know, on other days it would be less, other days it could be more. So it really just depends on, on the launch. It's, it's the orbit of space station and the time of day and time of year um, that determines that, that length of time. I, I will like, just add one more thing. You know, this is a test flight. You know, we, we talk about this launch, but this is a test flight, right? And so pick, we, could have, we could have picked different launch days that had different phasing opportunities, right? And, but there's also checkouts that we're doing along the way. Um, so we kind of picked a day that would also, a phasing opportunity that would give us the time to be able to do those checkouts along the way because this is a critical test flight. Bob and Doug are gonna get to test fly the vehicle and check it out and make sure that um, first time people are gonna be in a, a SpaceX vehicle and get to kind of, um, you know, take it out for a test run there and, and make sure that before it's certified that the design is working. So um, this is a really, really important flight for us. We got two great test pilots in there and uh, they're, they're gonna be checking out the vehicle. And if I could add one more thing, the, the Soyuz was designed in the 70s, started flying in the 80s and the norm has been 34 orbits or really uh, two days to get for the Soyuz to get to International Space Station. It's only been in the last three, three and a half years that they started going uh, to instead of two and a half, two days to get to six hours. Uh, and so um, I'm counting on on SpaceX to uh, to accelerate the time uh, uh, in the next 20 years. So <laughs> <they do theirs. laughs> I'll and I, I'll, I'll say Kathy makes a really good point. One of the cool things that the the, the uh, uh, and we're going to work on that, Kirk. <laughs> and I hope it's a lot sooner than 20 years. Uh, but uh, is it, Bob and I are going to get a chance to try sleeping on Dragon, and that's a really good point. And and, and another thing about the crew is, is that they have taken to heart as test pilots um, the importance of their work to to ensure 
the readiness of the vehicle and the system and the program for future crews. To them, in their mind, was always, is this the right, safe, reliable system for anybody to fly in, but, but also for, to make sure that their colleagues um, in, the, in, the, in the crew office would be able to continue to, to do exactly what they want to do. So they're testing it out, not just for themselves, but for um, all future flights. And that was one, that's exactly right. It's one of the reasons. We want to make sure they got to sleep on board, they got to you know, eat meals and, and do all that kind of cool stuff while they're on board Dragon, um, yet trying to get them to station as quickly and safely as possible. And our next question is from Jackie Waddles at CNN. Jackie? Hey, folks. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, my question is with, for Steve. Um, so with Doug Lavero leaving the ATO this week, Steve, I know you took over Doug's role in this review, and I was curious if you had to do any additional preparation to assume that role um, and if that last minute change created any challenges over the past couple of days. Yeah, actually, um, I've been conducting uh, agency level reviews of the commercial crew program for the last two years um, as the associate administrator, uh, as part of the, the my uh, chairmanship of the AG agency program management council. So every two to three months, Kathy has come in and briefed agency leadership, including myself, on the program. Um, so, uh, all the issues and challenges, the resolution of them, or paths to resolution. Um, so those reviews, you know, prepared me really well to uh, step in and chair the flight readiness review, as well as I think um, quarterly the aerospace safety advisory panel reviews the commercial program, program and Kathy makes a presentation to them. I think I've sat in on all or most of those reviews also. Um, so given all that, I was well prepared. I also want to stress that um, there was a series of really great reviews leading up to the flight readiness review. It wasn't just this one review. So there are engineering reviews of each system on Dragon and on Falcon um, by the engineering teams. Uh, they were a little concerned about doing those uh, virtually uh, versus face-to-face -face given COVID-19, but the feedback I got was that though I received was those reviews were very effective. Um, then there was the uh, station operations readiness review by Kirk, very good successful review. There was a flight readiness review by SpaceX, uh, led for their purposes. Uh, there was a flight test readiness review led by Kathy and the team, and that led up to the flight readiness review. Um, so I sat in also on some of those reviews. So um, I felt I felt uh, very very prepared to uh, chair the review. I and um, and so I don't think there are any significant challenges um, in transitioning uh, from Doug to myself and chairing the FRR. And our next question is from Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Marsha. Yes. Hello. Um, I'd like both SpaceX and NASA to address this. All space flight is risky, but this is a true test flight. And I'd like to um, a big picture from you on just how risky, how dangerous uh, this mission is that Bob and Doug are about to embark on. I'm not looking for statistics or numbers, but just in your guts, what are you feeling about the dangers and the risks uh, of this whole endeavor? Thank you. Well, there's lots of people that are NASA and space. <laughs> 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 well, you, you know, Marsha, I, I, um, it's really hard as a program manager because my job is to buy down risk, right? And um, for the last, like, if, if Steve laid out, I mean, really for the last five years as program manager, that's what I feel like I've been doing. So if I right now we are trying to identify any risk that we know of that's out there and continue to look at risks and buy them down but we also can't fool ourselves you know human spaceflight is really really tough um, and uh, you know we it's why we continue to look for risks and and um, do additional assessments and we're we never feel comfortable because that's when you're not searching, right? So um, I think, you know, we talked today about staying hungry. And so um, we're going to stay hungry and we're going to stay hungry till Bob and Doug come home. But I've thought of every single risk. We've been sitting here scouring, our teams are scouring and thinking of every single risk that's out there. And we've worked our butt off to buy down the ones we know of and we'll continue to look 
and continue to buy them down till we bring them home. Kathy said it very, very well. And, um, you know, it, it is tough. Space flight is hard. Um, but because of that, we search ourselves and search our souls. We encourage each other, um, you know, in our partnership with NASA and SpaceX, but certainly within our company, we encourage everybody to look e over each other's shoulders. Um, we say, you know, challenge each other all the time. Um, don't take offense when people challenge your work. We encourage it. Um, we are in the kind of the period right now of the final preparations for flight, but also where the majority of, you know, the engineers and, and, and people in the factory and everybody who've been working on this all of these years, they're now kind of into a period where they're doing their triple checks and quadruple checks. They're looking under every stone and turning over every rock just to make sure that we're really ready to go. And we have a standing policy in the company that anybody can, can, can raise an issue. Anybody can raise a risk. We have systems in place that actually allow anybody in the company to open a risk, what we call risk tickets, to open up an issue, to say, okay, I'm worried about something. And they have a direct line to you know, senior leadership to say, hey, I'm worried about this up to the moment of launch. Um, bottom line is, is it's tough, but we won't launch until we're ready. And, and we will listen to the data and we'll listen to the people. And our final question will be from Joey Roulette at Reuters. Joey? Hey, thanks so much for doing this. Um, this is for Kirk Shireman or anyone else. Um, Kirk, you mentioned the role international partners played. Uh, I was wondering if you could give some examples of the response and any concerns raised by those international partners, specifically Ross Cosmos, um, in regard to this review. And then for Benji Reed, um, will any data from this mission inform Starship design or Starship missions in the future, and would Starship ever do any test flights like this one to the space station? Thanks. Um, from an international star partner standpoint, it's really interesting. Uh, one is we're a partnership, and, and we expect all our partners, uh, astronauts and cosmonauts, to fly on these vehicles, on, on the SpaceX vehicles. So they have a very vested interest. In this particular test flight, there are no international partners. But the very next flight, there will be. And so uh, all the international partners were, were participating uh, along the way because they know that, that their crew members will be flying on this vehicle, number one. Number two is it's docking to the International Space Station, and all those countries have made huge investments in that vehicle. We want to make sure that we're not risking the investment uh, in, in that vehicle up there, or by the way, their crew members who are living on board the International Space Station. So all along, very, very interested. The, the, the uh, difficulties here, one, of course, I, I talked a little bit about time zones. That's always a difficulty. But we also had export control. So uh, when we develop a, a vehicle here in the United States, all that technology is not allowed to be exported from the United States. So we have to live within those laws. And finally, there's proprietary data. So if, if the data was allowed to be exported, but it was pro SpaceX proprietary, then we would have to redact that data. So we conducted these discussions with our international partners along the way, answered their questions, assured them that their crew members would be safe, all the while meeting the U.S. laws on export control and honoring the proprietary data from SpaceX. So um, the fact that we did that and uh, all the partners were, uh, were part of this review, were part of all this work, and were, were ready to proceed is really, uh, really an amazing thing. So uh, we're very, very happy about, about that aspect. Benji? Sure. And just kind of following up real quick first on what Kirk said, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting for us to get to work with international partners as well. We've had that opportunity on the cargo program um, from the early days because, again, they jointly run the space station um, and are partners in that. So w coming up and bringing cargo, we had to work with them. And getting to work with the partners and work with all kinds of people around the world is exactly what we want to do. We want to send all kinds of people to space. Um, and, and ultimately, this, this, this mission coming up and everything we're doing is, is to open that, that new chapter in, in the space age um, and ultimately make life multiplanetary. That's what we want to do. And it's exciting to do it and see after this mission um, you know, what, what more missions we'll be doing with the space station and with others. Um, in terms of the data um, and, you know, with, will this inform data on Starship or, or other programs? Absolutely. Data is data and we love it. We love data. We want to learn. We want to learn from everything we do and apply it wherever we can um, to be safer, to be more reliable, to be more efficient. Um, and again, ultimately be able to take lots and lots of people into space. Thank you. And now we'll go back uh, for some final closing comments for from Steve Dursick. Steve. Hey, thanks, Josh. 
So yeah, I just want to reiterate that we had a, a very successful flight readiness review in that we did a thorough review of all the systems and all the, all the risks. And uh, it was unanimous on the board that we are go for launch. Um, it is really exciting to be launching American astronauts on American rockets from American soil from Kennedy Space Center for the first time in nine years. Um, it's, I know it's been a long, really challenging road, um, and I just cannot um, tell you how proud I am of the NASA SpaceX team for all their uh, talent, hard work, dedication, and perseverance to get to this point of five days from launch. Um, I, I could hardly, I mean, I, I, am, I am incredibly excited and can hardly believe it. Um, so yeah, I, we want you to, to join us, uh, most of you virtually, unfortunately, <laughs> given the situation, uh, uh, on Wednesday, March 27th at 4.33 p.m. Uh, when we're gonna send Bob to Doug, and Doug to the International Space Station um, and Doc uh, 19 hours later, and they will become part of the next ISS expedition. Um, so with that, um, we'll conclude the, uh, the press conference.